But, but we're cousins, cousins identical cousins all the way. We, we talk a lot, we walk a lot, we sometimes we even fall a lot. <laughs> Why are you in the hospital? Uh, cause I'm an idiot, drank too much, crapped out my liver. Last Friday I brought her home and Saturday called an ambulance to bring her back. Because I was so erratic. And uh, her liver was shutting down. And it shot uh, ammonia in my brain. It affected her brain. Unfortunately, right. her liver is so bad, but we're very blessed that she's going to get a new liver and she's going to be around, because if she's not, Cause I we, told we her. We have to I'll, sit in the rocking chairs. Yeah, we got to <laughs> sit in the rocking chairs when we're older with Afghans on our laps. Yeah. Faith, family, and friends. We both have it. And sniff. Sniff. Because we always say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing, like, with our family, we say. When you um, hug somebody. Hug and kisses. And then they have their own um, scent. scent. You know, and it's just something that sticks with you, just like a memory. And you sniff. Mine's Derek Jeter, driven. Made by Avon. <laughs> You're so stupid. <laughs> Yeah, right back at you. <laughs> My mom, I know she's watching, all grandparents are watching. It's okay. They're all watching, they're all here. I smell them once in a while. <laughs> That's all right, you're around. You're allowed. Just got a second chance at life. Yep. It's huge. <laughs> it's winning the lottery. You know, so many people know who they're donating to, but I have absolutely no idea. I was actually told there were three potential candidates, and then I got a phone call on Tuesday, three days before my surgery, and was told that it was going to a female, close in age. She's continued to work full time while going through dialysis, and I heard she's been on the list since 2011. <laughs> Okay, we ready for this? <laughs> yes. yes, exciting okay. times. Okay, I've got to, I've already uh, did all your paperwork and checked over everything. Mm -hmm. I've got to put a little mark on the right side to say that's exactly where we're going to place the kidney. I know that the hospital, everybody loses their modesty, but that doesn't mean you have to. <laughs> I'm excited. Are you excited? Yes, I am. Excellent. All right, grab my stuff. All right. I'm going to see you later. Okay. Okay. I got here around 7 a.m. this morning, but I wanted to make sure the patients were seen and that everything was taken care of before I left. So mm -hmm. all I have to do when I come back is just concentrate on operating. I haven't missed an open house or a first day of school ever for my kids since they were in kindergarten, so. I have twins, a boy and a girl. It's funny because now, and, you know, I'll come home and they're like, well, did you do a transplant today? And I'm like, if I say no, then they're like, oh, like I didn't do anything all day. Like, oh, okay, well, you didn't transplant anybody. What did you do? But thankfully I have good partners and a good team and they let me push back the OR a little bit so I can make it to open house. I'm not nervous. There's always a little bit of the what if or the unknown, but I've sort of never lived my life that way. Um, so now, once I sort of signed the line and agreed to donate and went through the testing, I really haven't looked back. Even though you say you're not nervous, your blood pressure is still slightly elevated. Okay. So I'm going to give you some Versed, which is part of what your uh, okay. anesthetic is. Okay. And it helps to relax you. Sure. Thank you. Because our schedule is so haphazard and very much not an elective type of practice, transplant is always last minute. So in the living donor situation, one of the nice things for us is that these are scheduled uh, and these are planned weeks in advance, especially paired exchanges like this, and a lot of work goes into scheduling them. And I got some rest last night, so we're ready to go. In general, paired exchange or kidney swapping 
allows people to get transplanted that normally wouldn't be able to be transplanted. Years ago, we would have a donor and recipient pair come to see us, and for example, a, a husband wanted to donate to a wife, and they were both good candidates, except they didn't have the same blood type. In the past, we would oftentimes say, you know, we need to find a different donor. Now there are different networks of computer software that you can enter these people into, and the algorithm finds another pair that are incompatible. But if you swap the donors, the donor of that pair donates to that recipient, and that recipient's donor donates to our recipient, you can get two people transplanted. The story on this is always great. We had an altruistic donor. That is a person who gave of their own accord. They didn't know anybody. They just said, I want to give. And because of that one person, started a chain reaction of people who maybe had a donor, but they didn't match their donor. And so the donor gave to one of those people who had a person who couldn't give their kidney. That person then gave their kidney to somebody else, et cetera. Miss Dunn didn't have any living donors, so at the end of the chain, she got the last kidney. Well, John and I just thought that he, you know, he recruited me, and then somebody from the other end donated to him, and that's all we knew. And then they would try and find a match for me, and it was only on Thursday during pre-op where we learned that 12 people were involved, and you're number one. I didn't expect to meet anybody because that wasn't what I was doing. That was just giving something. So that to me was amazing. I was already felt very blessed that I got to see the recipient and actually get to see their story. And to meet other people involved with this is, is amazing to me. We met in high school, junior year, we were 16, and we've been married 19 years. What was he like when he was 16? He was funny, he was a little rebellious, but still had that same determination. When he was a resident is when I really began to understand what it would be like, you know, being like a single parent. You just kind of learn to make your plans and he does his best to be there. Well, he's saving lives so that like, when he's not home for, I guess, like a special occasion, like I know that he's out like helping someone else and it's for the better. And like, I don't know, just. <laughs> I heard that they had a liver for you. Yes. They had called us 328 this morning, and they said that, you know, we had to live around, like running up and down the halls, oh my God, and you know, telling everybody, and then, um, and uh, turned out it wasn't a good match. It wasn't like a perfect liver for her. It had some damage in it, so. There will be another one. Yeah. There will yep. be another one. Yep. Dr. Gooden, one of the transplant surgeons. I wanted to give you some good news. Yes. Well, today we have a liver offer. We're thinking it should go sometime this evening, if not early morning. Okay. So we'll keep you updated. But I did want to tell you. I in. know, I know. I just wanted to tell you. We're trying to figure out, in terms of timing, who's going to do what. Uh, so I may be your liver surgeon tonight, okay. uh, depending on how things work out. It's 
the middle of the night, as usual for these procurements. We're on our way to go get a liver for one of our patients. This is a really hard time for the family because you're there with your loved one who you've been told is dead. There's no blood flow going to their brain, but their heart's still beating. They're on a ventilator. Um, it's, it's a really horrible thing. The weekends are busier because people do die in especially trauma. Traumatic injuries um, happen more on the weekend, and so it's really the weekend and the beginning, Monday, Tuesday, are the busiest days for procurement. But the reason these happen at night are mostly just some, like coordinating everything at the donor hospital. Every year in Georgia, about 20% of the people on our waiting list um, die waiting for liver transplant every year. There just aren't enough organs available. It's basically not enough families saying yes um, to organ donation. You know, we have a lot of a lot of our patients out there struggling, fighting to survive, and tonight is a lucky night for just one of our patients. Every donor has the opportunity to donate seven organs, so two lungs, heart, liver, two kidneys and a pancreas, um, and, and actually an eighth intestine, which is more rare, but that's how many people can be tr saved with each donor. But tonight we're hoping uh, to get five, maybe six patients transplanted from this one donor. We usually take a week of call at a time, and donor weeks are probably my favorite week. It's always nighttime work, and I get to go home, take a little nap, and then play with the kids all day. So you would think that after transplant surgeons been doing it for a long time, that that feeling of just awe and wonder that this actually works would go away, but it doesn't. I mean, I've been doing this, did my first transplant 14 years ago, and it still, every single time, it's amazing. It, it, you just have these surreal moments during the operation where you think, how, how is it that this is working? It's amazing. Beautiful. <laughs> so just letting you know, everything's good. They've seen the liver, etc. So we are a go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first phone call that you'll get is the one that says, "Hey, we've actually gotten started." Oh, good. All right. And then so then I'm going to be uh, working on getting the liver out. By that time, my partner, Dr. Ponder, should be there putting up the liver so that we are ready to put it in. Pretty. Yeah. You can't it's just you can't just slap you know, it in. It. You gotta. It's gotta yeah, be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> is the liver it. here yet? No, it's is not. It it's, um, they actually haven't gotten it out yet, which is why we're delaying. We try to time it so there's not a lot of wait time in between. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. We are, listen, we are all excited. The team is all ready and excited to go. And, um, yeah, this is a blessing, so. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yep. The beauty of transplant, it's, we are taking death and making it into life. Um, there's a lot, these patients are sick and they need our care. Um, for me, it's a blessing to do what I do. Um, and I never take that for granted. And I enjoy it and it excites me. Um, I'm always up for a transplant because I know we're giving the patient another chance. And you can't, you can't beat that. All right, if there's any questions or concerns, please feel free to speak up. This is a no foot stomping zone unless the music is banging. I think people don't realize how many things the liver does for you. And I think more importantly than that, we don't have a really good backup. It's not like uh, kidneys where if your kidneys fail, you have dialysis. When your liver starts to fail, there's really no good backup and uh, it's either transplant or or you die, but it's ugly. You're out. So the liver is in. Dr. Gooden's sewing it in right now. It's been a long day. 
I'm going to try to go home and get a little bit of rest, and the team really worked hard today. If we think this has been out for days, then what's the point of taking him to the OR, honestly? The reality is it's, it delivers. This has probably been out, like you said, it's not been out for 12 hours or a day. It's been out for days. I just don't know why it was difficult to get through down there, but the whole thing seems like it's thrombosed. Jeez. Okay. I don't know. I can't explain it. When we talk to patients before transplant, we, when we talk about all the possible complications, this is the one that we all, I always, this is the devastating complication. So when your liver is completely failed, there's nothing we can do to, to replace it. So kidney failure, you can go on dialysis. Heart failure, you can get a, put, put, a pump put in or put on something called ECMO. Um, but when your liver totally shuts down, there's nothing that we can do to replace it. The reason that transplant surgeons don't survive in this profession for long, like liver transplant surgeons, half of them are no longer doing liver transplants seven years after fellowship. And the reason is that it just wears on you. 30% major complication rate with liver transplants and having to go and, and you know, it's a very humbling profession to have to go and like what Dr. Pollinger is doing right now. This is the worst conversations you have to have with family or when you go in and you say, you know, I, what I'd hooked together is no longer Peyton or working anymore. But it's like the thing that, that wears on you and, and you know, he won't sleep for days. Like Harrison, it, it's just hard to get, to get through. Even though these things happen to all of us and you know, his complication rate is lower in every category than national averages. And that makes, you can fall back on that to help you sleep at night a little bit, but the reality is like the one patient that has that major complication is, it just ages you, tech, you know, it, it makes, it's a bad part of our job. Right, so that was a committee review. Oncology and cardiac clearance just to get her to IP. He's we'll just wondering how here, sick so. she is. Like, do we need to move faster? Her mouth's 18. She's going to die in the next, you know, couple of years without a liver. Just I mean, waiting. the oncologist, the only documented thrombocytopenia is the reason we consulted, which I'm sure that they get a lot of liver failure patients with that. They're used to doing that and probably didn't look through the lymphoma record, so. but. If he went in there with a scope and it looked like everything's a disaster in the right and left upper quadrants, he could just do a J-tube and be done and see what happens. So yeah, we, need to, to, we need to get oncology to say, what's her risk of recurrence? So she sounds, I mean, to me, like she's not a surgical candidate now. We strive for perfection. We can't make mistakes. Um, and even when we don't make mistakes, uh, when we feel it's a beautiful, beautifully orchestrated operation, this sort of stuff happens and it's frustrating. And it's sometimes easy to get down and uh, ask why, uh, which is what I've been doing for the last 48 hours. And sometimes you never know. And transplant is funny like that. But my focus today is to fix it and give him a new liver and a new blood supply and hopefully this is just a, a bad memory for he and his family. 
was able to see for myself. The liver is soft and, and nice pink and purple color, smooth edges, and looks like a, a healthy, normal liver. Hey, Bubba. Hi. What are you guys doing? <laughs> I did two kidney transplants, and I have one more still on. I won't see you guys till late tonight. I'll come give you kisses. You will be asleep, buddy. It'll be like, it'll be midnight. Now, Abby, I love you. I love you. I love you, Bubba. I love you. I'll see you guys tomorrow morning, but I've got to go. They're both really sweet, where they always are glad I'm helping somebody, but they're also like, Sometimes choking back the tears and just, it's hard to, it's hard for them to understand. But tomorrow, if I don't get a called in for liver, then I'll get to spend the whole day on a uh, field trip to the botanical gardens. So make up for it a little bit. As a college student, David spent his weekends tutoring youth in underserved communities. He spent hours teaching, but he didn't just leave after the lessons were over. He always talked about playing ball with the kids until it was too dark to play. He really became part of their lives. David just recently graduated from college with a degree in social work. Last month, he accepted a job working for a nonprofit servicing vulnerable communities to break cycles of violence, abuse, and addiction. David is an exceptional person who looked forward to making a real difference in people's lives. When they presented the idea of donating David's organs, there was not one single moment of hesitation. David lived his life helping people. He would be so incredibly humbled to know his life is giving hope to so many others.